Hi, I'm Dan Lynch, and up next on Floss Weekly, join myself and Simon Phipps, where we talk about FOSDEM, the largest free and open source software conference in Europe. Up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly, episode 152, recorded Wednesday, the 9th of February, 2011. Fosden. Floss Weekly is brought to you by MailRoute for all your email spam and virus protection. Visit MailRoute.info and get a 10% discount for the life of your account. Hello and welcome to Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I'm your host for this week. Uh, my name is Dan Lynch and uh, I'm uh, sitting in for the regular host, Randall Schwartz. As you'll notice, uh, we sound slightly different. And uh, it's actually something of a British takeover of the show today. Um, beware, the Brits are coming. But uh, I am also joined by Simon Phipps over in, uh, well, he's actually in the same country as me in Southampton. Simon, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, our international listeners may not be aware, but uh, Southampton is as far from Liverpool as San mm. Jose is from uh, San Francisco, well, almost, uh, and yet it feels mm. like you're in another country up there. Um, so uh, it, <clears throat> we don't necessarily feel as closely affiliated as we may look on the map. No, no, and uh, routing your local calls via the other side of the world also probably doesn't help. <laughs> doesn't help you to feel any more, any more closely located. But uh, yeah, so it's it's great to have you, to uh, have you back on. And um, I uh, we've had a, a last minute change of, of change of plan. We were due to be joined by Dan Walsh from uh, Red Hat, who was going to talk to us about uh, SE Linux, which is what I've been trailing in previous weeks and so on. Um, I'm not sure what's actually happened to Dan. We can't seem to get him uh, online at the moment. So apologies for that. So we're going to actually talk about uh, the event of the last weekend and FOSDEM more uh, more specifically which is the uh, let me get this right it's the it's the free open source developers European meeting and it's been going about 10 11 years now it's probably I would say the biggest open source or free software event in Europe certainly um, you know thousands of, uh, of, of geeks there lots of great keynote speakers lots of great dev rooms um, a real kind of community event and certainly the largest community event that I've seen anyway uh, it makes yes, a refreshing it, change it, it's up there mm. with uh, linux.conf.au is uh, a, mm. a, a big conference down in australia and the then down in brazil they have uh, feastle uh, which is ah. a free software event for uh, latin america and those three together are of similar size between three and five thousand attendees and uh, mm. typically attended by very uh, uh, well-known decision makers uh, code developers, committers, and also by uh, politicians and uh, mm. uh, national decision makers as well, which is uh, an interesting dimension you don't always see. Yeah, I mean, one of the virtues of being in Brussels, as we say, is it's the home of the European uh, Parliament. So uh, hopefully it gives us a chance to, to get some involvement with that. And uh, one of the interesting things about, about FOSDEM, I find, uh, considering the size of it, is that they managed to keep the event free, as in free as in beer and free as in, in speech, but free as in beer to, to enter anyway. Um, there's no uh, cover charge to get into the event. And they managed to, to keep everything going through merchandise sales and uh, sponsorship and things like that. It's quite impressive. So uh, it's mm. very interesting going there. I used to get, attend there as a Sun Microsystems employee, and Sun mm. used to sponsor the conference by having me go and actually uh, uh, pay cash at the desk in FOSDEM. So it's a very mm. relaxed event with very relaxed approach to organization, and yet well sponsored by corporations and incredibly mm. well attended by open source projects. Uh, I, I think that comes out in the, uh, in, in, in the discussion that we had while we were waiting for our guests. Yeah, that's true, and uh, it, it's a good job you you um, you didn't mention that at the time that you used to used to pay with cash in Brussels. You'd be getting uh, strange people following you around if they think you've got that much cash on you. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, we should we should mention on the subject of sponsors. Uh, we have a sponsor this week for the show, which is MailRoute.info. Now, uh, being a 
being a British uh, chap, I, I, I would say mailroute.info, but for the for the purpose of this, I would say mail route because I know that's uh, that's the way it's done over there. So um, in case you don't know, uh, mail route is um, a way of uh, filtering out spam from your email. And uh, as it says here, it's a secure hosted service that filters virus and spam for companies of any size. Um, whether you're a single user or a company with tens of thousands of employees, mail route can eliminate viruses, spam, reduce the load on your email server, lower your costs, and make your email usable again. Typical MailRoute customers see a 95% reduction in their inbound email volume with virtually no false positives. Uh, Leo uses MailRoute. He loves it. He's been using it for six years. And uh, recently, Tom Merritt has also joined and started using MailRoute and uh, found that he's able to use email domains that he'd long given up on in the past because of the, uh, the problems with spam, obviously, uh, which is very cool. Uh, Tom Johnson, the founder and CEO of MailRoute, uh, started one of the very first companies in this market back in 1998, which was called Front Bridge, and Front Bridge was later acquired by Microsoft, and uh, Microsoft uh, still offer that service as part of their Microsoft Exchange hosted services line. Uh, but Tom wasn't finished uh, wasn't finished there, and he went on to uh, to start MailRoute, his next generation uh, service for filtering email with a level, high level of accuracy and uh, a low uh, a price that's unmatchable. So. Um, if you want to find out more about MailRoute and you want to get involved, you can go to MailRoute.info uh, to sign up. And as a Twit listener, you receive a 10% discount for the life of your account. Uh, small business accounts start from $2, um, $2 per user per month for up to 10 users. Uh, and because of the demand from the Twit army, uh, MailRoute have now added a new personal uh, service for individual users. And uh, you can uh, you can get that for $30 per user per year for single users. And uh, if you, you can find out more at MailRoute.info. Info, very simple. Go there, sign up, and uh, liberate your email from spam. Cool. So now that we've uh, we've covered the the sponsorship angle, we should uh, we should join our earlier discussion about uh, about Fosdem and find out more about that. Yeah. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, um, just in case uh, you, you don't know, Fosdem is uh, the let me get this right. It's the free open open source developers European meetup. That's right, isn't it? Oh, them. There we go. We'll get it right pretty eventually. close. Yes. <laughs> I always get that wrong. I, 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 uh, I kind of yeah, get it messed. Up. I'm sure it's free open source developers European meeting. Yeah, it's held in Brussels every year, and uh, it's oh, I don't know three three and a half thousand geeks, something like that. Four thousand geeks more, all coming together. More than together. that, I think. Actually, I think it's they they oh, really? they've peaked at, they've peaked at five thousand at one point. No idea what it wow. was this year, and this there's really no way of finding out because the event's completely free. And uh, mm. there's no registration, so you can just turn up and True. walk in. And so there's really no way of knowing how many people were there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it was very crowded, though. I mean, I, I everywhere you tried to walk, there was like 10 people in the way, and you'd have to kind of take half an hour to fight your way through. And you're, uh, you, you did a talk in the free Java room, which was actually, I, just, I couldn't get into because it was that popular that they locked the doors. It was a health, it was a, uh, a safety, fire safety hazard or something to get more people in there. So Yeah, it was already well over the fire limit when I started, and there was a line <laughs> of uh, 50 or so people outside the room wanting to come in. I don't think they wanted to hear me speak, really. I think it was all to hear Stephen O'Grady from Red Monk talking about mm. whether Java was finished. I think that was what they all really wanted. All oh, right, cool. So did so, it go okay? I, I, I think it went well, yes. Uh, we, mm. we, we had mm. some great talks in the Java room. Um, there was a very interesting talk. There's a guy there who is porting Android to Linux so yeah. that you can uh, run Android apps on your Linux desktop. That's um, quite cool. I think so so that, that's a project called Ice Robot. You want to go look out for, for that. And then mm. the... Um, the, the Libra Java community is busy porting uh, Java Web Start over to Linux so that uh, you don't have to live without Java Web Start if you are going to use the uh, Libra version of Java. So that, that was exciting as well. And then the mm -hmm. Oracle guys were there talking about the Java roadmap as well. Uh, you'll, you know, uh, if you've been following Java at all, um, Oracle announced the new governance for OpenJDK last week. And it's uh, caused a certain amount of um, negative reaction, shall we say, in the community. And mm. so that was a very, a very hotly debated topic in the Java room. 
Yeah, it's yeah, it's very kind of. Uh, I believe there was some hot debates in there that I unfortunately missed out on quite a few of them. But I did spend most of Sunday, I think, uh, in the in the free Java dev room with uh, Tom Marble and some of the other guys in there. And I saw uh, B Dale Garby talking about his um, uh, what's it called? A, uh, oh, I'm going to get it wrong now. Altus Metrum, I think it's called his project for uh, to measure uh, his uh, homemade rockets. His um, he makes rockets and you know fires them uh, and to try fires them up and he wants to use open source. He's writing his own uh, open source software and also using open hardware to create a little board which will um, measure things like altitude and um, you know maybe GPS and things like that on there. And he's using Java for that, which is cool. So one thing I've learned about Brussels, as, as far as I can tell, I mean, I have, I have to confess that my first time at Brussels, uh, in Brussels, sorry, um, not, I'm not a FOSDEM veteran like Simon, but uh, I, uh, I did notice that the, you can't seem to move anywhere. That, that place is so packed, uh, even in, in the bars and things in the middle of the town. There's always about 50 people trying to cram into enough space for 10 people. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there were some places that were less busy when I was looking at them. Um, mm. uh, you know, it, it may be, I'm, I'm probably getting into terrible trouble for saying it, but you know, I, I wandered past the mono room and there weren't a lot of people in there. Uh, it, maybe yeah. it was a break, maybe it was a break or something. Um, yeah, so that's true. Uh, I'd be interested in what other rooms you went in, Dan, because I, I, w I visited the Libra office room as well, which was getting, mm -hmm. un getting a, a pretty good attendance and I'd be yeah. happy to run through the stuff that happened in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I check out some of the uh, embedded dev room. Um, I was interested in, uh, there was a talk on Mego in there, uh, which I've been tr trying to follow lately. I was sent, uh, I don't think I've talked about this on the show, but I was sent uh, a few Mego netbooks by Intel to, uh, to well, partly to give out on our show, Linux Outlaws, but also to review Mego 1.1 and see how it's going. Um, so I, I've been trying out on the netbook, and I found some rough edges that I, I shared with with the Migo guys, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but you know, I, overall, I think it, it's looking very positive. Uh, I want to see how how Nokia are doing on their end of things. So I'm at the moment negotiating with some Nokia people to come on and talk about that. What uh, what rooms did what other rooms did you go in apart from the uh, the free Java dev room then, Simon? So I was I went and visited the uh, the, the Libra Office room. Um, that's uh, you'll hmm? you'll recall that Libra Office is the uh, the new name for OpenOffice.org. Uh, the yep. community has got together, started a new project. Uh, very mm -hmm. interesting. Had all the founders of that project together talking about mm -hmm. their rationale behind it. I also went down to the auditorium and uh, heard Michael Meeks from Novell explaining why he personally felt that the uh, that starting LibreOffice was necessary, talking about mm -hmm. uh, the difficulty that he'd had contributing. And in particular, he was showing very interesting statistics about how uh, once they got rid of the contributor agreement and started mm. the LibreOffice project, the number of contributions from the community shot straight through the roof with uh, contributions wow. of all sizes coming in, lots of small contributions coming in, but also mm. uh, one or two significant contributions. Like, for example, um, the new version of LibreOffice has a proper SVG ed editor in it at last. And mm. uh, the new version of uh, LibreOffice has got the presenter console shipped as a default so you don't have to go along and add it in later so they're already mm. making great progress and they're only really a, a couple of months old uh, but mm. he was talking talking also about how they devoted quite a lot of their time to fixing the build environment so uh, one of the big problems on openoffice.org was that the build environment was so complex and the code was so um, f crud infested with commented mm. out code that was decades old and comments in uh, random languages uh, that they felt that the, the first thing they ought to do was go tidy the code up, tidy the build environment, and they now have uh, a project well underway to simplify the build environment and shrink the size of the code. And that too is leading to people joining the developer community and joining in with contributions. Mm, excellent. Sounds good. Um, did you? I don't know if you noticed, but they actually put the LibreOffice stand and the OpenOffice stand right next to each other in the main corridor, and uh, I, I believe that may have caused some uh, some interesting conversations to happen during the event. Uh, you know, I, I I think that everyone there is pretty good humoured. Uh, I, I didn't notice mm. any fist fights breaking out. Uh, it was fairly <laughs> easy to identify the people who were from the LibreOffice uh, stand because they were all wearing these green hoodies. So they looked like a, a legion of digital monks, all in green, mm. Uh, mm. going cowled down to uh, lead the faithful into the new direction. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's an interesting, uh, interesting thing that happens at these events. Often you get um, projects who maybe in public might not be perceived as being the best of friends kind of pushed into a small room together. And to be fair, I don't think I've ever seen any real animosity between any projects. I think, you know, overall, um, I may be biased, but I think as a kind of free open source software community, we generally get along uh, when we need to. <laughs> Yeah, well, this was one of my points that I, I in the talk that I did in the the uh, Libra Java room, I was um, uh, giving my talk about the lessons that I learned making Java into free software when I was at Sun. And one of the mm. lessons that I was telling people was how important it is for human beings occasionally to meet each other. How your electronic conversations that you have on IRC or uh, on uh, instant messaging, they mm. support your real human relationships. And if you never have the time to actually meet each other, drink beer together, eat food together, there's a risk that the uh, conversation spirals out of control and becomes very toxic. And I think one of the mm. great things that FOSDEM does for free software is provide a place where people get to know each other and become uh, better friends and are able to realize that uh, maybe it's just a misunderstanding of communication rather than an intentional insult when bad things happen. Mm. And it's amazing how different people often, um, as you say, how different pe people communicate in um, in face to face, as to you know, as opposed to in email or uh, in forums and chat rooms and things. I mean, I've noticed that myself. I met um, quite a few Linux Outlaws listeners at the uh, event, and it's interesting to to see the kind of the difference of how they communicate. Uh, how they communicate with me, say via the chat room and stuff, and how much they're much quieter and more kind of. I don't know. Um, I don't know what the word is, but they're much kind of quieter and controlled in real life. I think perhaps the uh, the anim uh, anonymity of having something like an IRC channel where you can have a you know a handle that could be nothing to do with your real name, all that kind of stuff. It, it does enable a sort of um, I don't know a more controversial way of of uh, communicating. I think it's good, as you say, to get people in one room and and kind of communicate face to face. Uh, you yeah. know, the, the, other, the, the other thing you discover is that uh, actually um, most geeks are really quite nice people when you uh, get around to drinking with them. And mm. I think that's a good thing. Hey, I, I've got a yeah. toy I ought to show you that I, I got. I don't know oh, whether cool. you saw uh, Jan, Jan Wilderboer from Red Hat on the Fedora I did. Stand. I know Jan very well, yeah. And, uh, he was giving out uh, these. So I, I now have um, a, my... Oh, um, you've got a my, transnational... I have got now my, my transnational passport here. <laughs> that uh, shows that I'm a citizen of the Transnational Republic. You can probably just see it. I shouldn't show it on screen for too long because it's full of confidential information. Yeah, I was going to say, of which, don't, don't, don't. Some, of, some of which is even true. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, just just as a bit of background for anyone who doesn't know, um, Jan works at, uh, at Red Hat, and I, I, I met first met Jan a few years ago at uh, Linux Tag in Berlin. Uh, he's a great guy, and uh, he he works in Munich in the Red Hat office there, doing the um, you know the inductions for new employees and stuff like that. But one of his other jobs is to lobby at the European Parliament and so on. And uh, his latest kind of uh, project, I suppose, is um, which is not Red Hat affiliated, as far as I know. I should say before uh, before we get uh, into trouble, there is he's yeah he's he's trying to create a new um, passport for the people basically living online, essentially. So yeah, he's calling it the transnational ID card. I think it is. It's transnational Republic. You're saying so the sorry the yeah concept, transnational Republic. The, the uh, I'm going to put the um the the link to that into the chat so that uh, people who are watching live can see it. Maybe it'll show up somewhere else as well. The idea mm. is that it's a, a, a to to start having um uh, aggregations of people that are not geographic that are based on um, your uh, interest group. And so um, a Transnational Republic is this, this idea to start a, a cascading affiliated set of people who are, uh, it's kind of like Cory Doctorow's book, if you've read his, his book Eastern Standard Tribe, uh, where he mm. asserts that people are associated by, more by time zone than they are by geography. Transnational Republic is the, is the, um, the political association for Eastern Standard Tribe. Mm. Yeah, that's it's very interesting. I mean, I... Um... I unfortunately I never got time to, to grab a card myself. I was too busy running around. But uh it's it's interesting how this kind of relates to um the whole key signing thing, which is very big at FOSDEM. There's a massive queue of uh, of people all all the way down the road queuing up to sign each other's keys and um and uh, the whole web of trust thing, which I was talking there. Uh, Tom Marble was actually telling me about that. And uh, I was outed as a, as a, <laughs> a um I don't know, what's the I don't know what the word is, a, a kind of a faux geek in some ways. 
sat, I was sat at dinner with uh, Vidal Garby and uh, Tom Marble and some other people, and Tom said, will you sign my key? And I had to admit that I didn't have a key at the moment. Um, yeah, there was some shaking of heads and so on. But it kind of almost relates to that, the whole um, web of trust. So, you know, I vouch for who you are and you can vouch for me and, and that kind of uh, exponentially uh, can, can be expanded, I suppose. So, so did you go along to um, Eben Moglen's keynote? Because uh, I did. Uh, it would be good mm. to tell on, on that subject of uh, freedoms. It's probably worth relaying a bit of that keynote, Dan. Mm. Yeah, um, Eben uh, Eben Moglen, who is the um, the head of the uh, Software Freedom Law Center in New York, who I've, uh, I've done some work with in the past. Uh, he uh, he gave the opening keynote for FOSDEM and uh, his talk was uh, broadly about many of this, the kind of problems we have now with uh, liberty on the internet and freedom of speech and so on in relation particularly to things that have happened recently in uh, Tunisia and Egypt uh, where in Egypt they tried to, the government effectively tried to cut the citizens off the internet to stop them from communicating, which is obviously a problem. And um, I mean, I suppose the, the way I kind of interpreted most of what Evan was saying, and I I'm certainly don't want to put words into his mouth anyway, but it seemed to me as though he's advocating an alternative uh, internet or dark net, as some people may call it, which couldn't be cut off by, um, you know, a central service provider mm. or something, a mesh networking he's talking about as well. Yes, yeah, so he's got this idea of a, of a box that you can plug in that, uh, hosts your parts of the the uh, internet so that mm. uh, you're not reliant on people who are uh, not under your control to host those uh, th things about identity. It links in a little bit into some of the ideas that the VRM folks have had, that's the vendor relationship management people have had about the uh, you keeping your identity and your personal information and licensing it or delivering it partially just to the people who need it. And I, I thought that Eben's ideas mm. flowed into that quite well as well. Yeah, and he's just, uh, I think, a couple of days before uh, FOSDEM actually launched the Freedom Box Foundation, uh, where they aim to to promote this and, uh, as he said, kind of make hardware that people can use easily enough at home, that someone can just take it home, plug it into their, you know, phone connection or internet connection, and uh, get something uh, get something out of it in, in, in order to kind of create this mesh network. Um, it's an interesting idea, but obviously, uh, at some point, that network will have to be, um, will have to be, connected to the larger internet. So I suppose we could still be cut off from the wider internet, but um, if our network were uh, self-contained to some degree, we'd, we'd at least have peer-to-peer -peer communication. Right. Uh, and uh, what's more, if you've got lots of people who are uh, in close proximity and are using mesh networking, being cut off from the internet is much harder. It's no longer the decision of President Mubarak to cut you off. Mm -hmm. It's now mm -hmm. the decision of all of your neighbors to isolate you. And that's a much harder thing for a central authority to decide to, uh, to execute on. So it isn't even the idea that you've got lots of big upline, upstream connections. It's the idea that you're connected to all of your neighbors with whom you have human relationships. And it's the idea of a, an internet which is based on a web of trust. And I think that's the thing that really makes, uh, makes it appeal to me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, as a, well, I don't want to keep harping on the same point, but it goes back to the whole key signing thing. And uh, yeah, and as you say, the web of trust and, uh, and all of that. I think it, it's very interesting. I think th there are some challenges that... Um, that Eben kind of glossed over, like the hardware, how do we get the hardware, how do we make it affordable? Um, and you know, I'm, I'm not a hardware guy, so I don't know how easy that is, but uh, it'd be interesting to see how they try and solve that problem of making a box and getting it mass produced and also distributing it as well. Um, it should be interesting. Well, so, so one of the dimensions to that as well, uh, one of the other people there was John Phillips uh, from, mm. um, uh, the, from Identica and from StatusNet. Uh, who That's always right, yeah. shows up at these events, and he, 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 he's very good for buying his beer and, and being a hospitable host. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, one of the things that's interesting about John that not a lot of people are aware of is that he's also interested in uh, uh, free hardware. Um, one mm. of the devices that he's come up with is a, uh, a device that can act as part of that mesh network. So I don't think that the hardware necessarily needs to be a huge problem for us as long as we've mm. got enthusiastic entrepreneurs like John who can um, take the community's vision forward. Yeah, John's very involved with uh, Hackspaces as well, um, or the Hackspace movement and setting up free Hackspaces, which is something I've had a, a limited involvement with um, here in Liverpool and uh, in other places. Um, there's actually a Hackspace in Manchester, which is, um, for those not familiar with UK geography, is about 
I don't know, 40 miles from Liverpool. Um, it takes about an hour in a car, a little under an hour. Um, they have a, a really interesting project going on there called uh, called uh, Mad Lab, which is a fantastic name. Uh, I forget what it stands for. Manchester something, something laboratory, something digital laboratory. Uh, but I think they just like the, the Mad Lab uh, acronym, to be honest. But yeah, they, they've got a, a community space there, which uh, can be used by different groups to... From the from things like log uh, log groups to meet there, and there's a Drupal user group that uh, meets there, which I attend sometimes. And they also have a free hardware hacking space that people can get into and get involved with things like Arduino, get the circuit boards out, get the soldering irons, and stuff like that. And I think that's a really interesting thing because um, not many people get enough chance to really uh, to really talk about uh, you know to really get involved with with hardware hacking. It, it's difficult. So being able to go somewhere where they've already got some equipment, and maybe there's somebody there who can talk to you um, that would be uh, that would be really cool yeah uh, actually there's one of those hack spaces just starting up here in Southampton where I live mm. and uh, yeah, I'm cool. looking forward to seeing how what what comes of that I don't know if you got downstairs in the uh, the annex building at Fosdem and saw all of the hardware that was on display because there was actually a really big hack culture at Fosdem as well with people with uh, not not just Arduinos and uh, FPGAs, but also people mm. with complete motherboard designs and uh, uh, all sorts of interesting embedded devices, um, mm. playthings. There was a whole hacker culture there of doing hardware hacking too. Mm. Did you see any of the um, the, the uh, Panda board? I think they were calling it. Uh, did I get that right? Panda board. The the ones they were showing actually not far from the the Free Java Dev Room over in. Uh, um, we had. Uh, I talked to some people a couple of years ago about the Beagle board, which uses the OMAP, which used the OMAP three processor, and it was all open hardware. Um, very cool. They, they were doing a demo by showing uh, Big Book Bunny, which is the Creative Commons uh, one of the Blender Open Movie Project um, movies, and they were showing that off this little board, which would fit in like a cigarette packet or something. And uh, they're very cheap, and they're trying to get people to use that. But they've brought out an even better one now, or a newer model, I should say, called uh, the Panda board. I don't know where they get the names, but uh, I think that they sound quite cool. And uh, that's got a, a dual core processor on it with uh, more than a gig of power in each in each core. Um, it's got a HDMI output on it, and they were running a whole kind of video wall off it. That was really impressive. Very, very exciting. And then around the other side of the uh, annex building, there were all of the telephone people. So there was um, mm. uh, SIP, SIP Communicator. with They've, they've got a fantastic-looking piece of software that uh, runs on any platform that provides you with video conferencing, audio, and SIP chat, and that's all embeddable code. And then there were mm. the guys from, from FreeSwitch around the front as well who Free are very interesting people. Um, for the FreeSwitch project is pr producing a, uh, a, a, a voice over IP uh, telephony switch, which has been built from the ground up to be much easier to configure than Asterisk, and also to have a, a much easier and broader support for uh, codecs. And they've mm. made amazing progress in the last year on FreeSwitch. I was talking to Michael Bielski, who uh, uh, has a German voice over IP company, and he was explaining to me just how strong FreeSwitch is now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I've always wanted to um, to look at because one of, I, mean, I think we talked about this before, um, particularly when uh, I had the, the Big Blue Button as one of the guest projects on, on Floss. Um, looking for a really, really good open source alternative to Skype, I think, is... Uh, is something that uh, would be really useful for a lot of people, and uh, I, I hopefully uh, things like free switch can be a big part of that. So uh, um, I, I, I'm, mm. I, I've been chatting with Michael about this. Um, he's been very interested in trying to get more and more of us using it. Uh, he's suddenly of a, of a contrarian as well. He prefers to run it on uh, Illumos, which you know is the fork of Open Solaris. And uh, mm. he says he gets much better performance on there. It's much more stable. I'm sure there is a great argument to be had there, and maybe a, a showdown between free switch on Linux, free switch on Illumos to try and get the yeah. two things uh, working better. That would be really interesting. Yeah, maybe we could get some benchmarks or, or as you say, some kind of um, showdown between the two, because I think it would be really interesting. Um, there's quite a lot of Linux distributions now which are aimed at uh, being an out-of-the-box kind of P a PBX system uh, you can just install. I know um, th that we've they've had some guests on uh, on Floss. In fact, in the past, before my involvement with Floss, uh, where I was a listener and then I heard some stuff about that, which is very interesting. Um, yeah. So one of the other things I'd like I wanted to kind of mention, uh, which which was a big event for me that happened at uh, Fosdem, was 
there was a new release of Debian uh, actually on the Saturday night of Fosdem. And, yeah, how uh, often does that happen? <laughs> well, every two years or so now, they reckon. Um, it averages every two years. And uh, I had a good word with um, with Zach, who's the, I can't pronounce his full name, but uh, with, with Zach, who's the, the current Debian project leader. And we actually ended up stuck on a bus together trying to get back into the centre of Brussels. And when I say stuck on a bus, there was about, I don't know, 100 people on this bus and we were all kind of squashed in like sardines. Unfortunately, um, I, I ended up squashed next to this this guy who I didn't actually know at the time. And, and we started talking because we were basically, you know, you didn't have much choice when you're in that small space with someone and it turned out he was the dpl and then i quizzed him about the release and and all that kind of stuff and uh, yeah so the new release is uh, is called squeeze and one of the funny things i i thought was uh, he was telling me they've run out of names from the original toy story film because all of the debian releases are named after toy story characters obviously we've had woody and sarge and all those kind of things and apparently the only character left that they haven't used in the original toy story is the car which is called buggy and they don't want to release <laughs> Debian, Debian Buggy because it won't look very good. <laughs> so they're going to move on to Toy Story 2 and some of the other, I think even Toy Story 3 now. But um, yeah, I thought that was quite quite hilarious. The idea of Debian Buggy uh, would be quite funny. But yeah, it's, uh, Debian, uh, the new version's out now. Uh, I had a good chat with some of the, the Debian guys. And you can always spot them at any conference because they wear, they're the guys with the hairy legs and the, the kilts. They, uh, yes, they have that, a Debian that, 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 that DebConf they had in Scotland had a huge impact on the Debian community, <laughs> reintroducing yeah. the, uh, t the tartan kilt as acceptable daywear for uh, free software developers. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it certainly did. I mean, uh, in case anyone do, uh, who doesn't know, uh, yeah, the Debian, when they had DebConf in um, in Edinburgh a while ago up in Scotland, uh, somebody, I, I, I can't remember who exactly it was, so you have to forgive me for not giving them credit, um, decided to get a Debian tartan made, which uh, you can have your own tartan made up um in uh, in some of the shops up there so they had their own debian tartan made and then of course all of the debian p uh, developers decided to buy kilts it was kind of like a standard thing they were all going to wear these debian kilts uh, and i believe that, that the uh, the the tartan actually has the name debian encoded into it somehow um it's not it's not binary. I forget the name of the code. There's some code in the pattern of the uh, of the tartan, which actually it has some significance to Debian, which is quite interesting. Yeah, so, so I'm just looking at the web page for that up on the tartan register, and uh, mm. it does indeed show that um, the white lines are arranged to spell out Debian in Morse code with the uh, <laughs> with the correct one to three ratio of dots to dashes, and um, mm. then the 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 red in the tartan is the Debian swirl. Uh, and mm. uh, they've got yellow, black, and white in there for tux as well. So it's a, oh, it's okay. actually a, a deeply symbolic and meaningful tartan. <laughs> and uh, I, I, you know, I was actually at that DebConf, and I, I almost wished mm. that I had uh, splashed out the in incredibly large amount of money involved in getting a kilt. Uh, almost. <laughs> right, right. How much are the kilts, Ben? Just, just out of interest. Uh, I seem to remember them being uh, in the couple of hundred pounds range. Which always seems mm. to me a bit steep, bit steep for a, a length of fabric, but of mm. course I'm I, I live as far from Scotland as you can get and still be British. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. You're on the south coast down there, yeah. So um, that was quite interesting. I, I had a, a chat with the with the Debian guys, and I was pleased to see that they've actually uh, overhauled their website now and made it uh, dragged it into the 21st century. Um, and I mean, I, I was on record as a bit of a critic of the the way it looked before. It was very, very basic. But um, I mean, it did uh, did uh, did a good job for them. But I was talking to um, talking to B Dale about this. He was saying it'll take him a little while to get used to to the new design. They've got some funky graphics on there. And Zach was telling me one of the big efforts they had made was to get the download link directly on the front page and things like that. So they're they're trying to kind of improve their branding and graphics and things as well, which is uh, which is cool. So uh, any other stands that caught your eyes? Uh, th th we should say about the way FOSDEM works is FOSDEM is uh, held on the campus of mm. the, uh, the Free University in Brussels, ULB. And mm -hmm. the, uh, the way to think about FOSDEM is it's like a, a gathering of user groups rather than like a traditional conference. So each um, project has got a, a developer room that they have applied mm. for. And then the, uh, all of the hallways between the lecture theatres where each of the dev rooms are being held are filled with tables that are covered with uh, hardware, with t-shirts, CDs being given away, uh, members of communities desperately trying to uh, either recruit passers-by or more likely sell them trinkets and trash of some kind. So was there anything in particular that struck you on any of those tables, Dan? The, the huge life-size stuffed camel 
um, struck me on the pearl table. I don't know if you saw that. No, um, I, that I, I actually missed that. Uh, I saw all uh, the pearl okay. books, but I missed out on the camel. Right, yeah, they had a, well, I say life-size, it probably wasn't life-size, I may be, may be exaggerating that in hindsight, but uh, certainly a very, very large um, cuddly toy camel, uh, which uh, I actually sent a, a message to Randall about, because I thought he'd appreciate that, being a, a pearl guy that he is, um, so I sent him a quick message about that, and unfortunately I, I didn't send him a picture, I should have snapped a picture, but uh, yeah, that was, that, was, um, that was certainly eye-catching as far as, uh, as the stands go, and on the Open, uh, open Sue's stand, uh, they kept trying to ply me with beer, which uh, which obviously caught my eye. Um, they they had something called um, what was it called now? Rot, something Toad, Old Toad, or yeah, it was toad a, it's a very something. interesting graphic. It was called Old Toad, and it was a Old a toad. toad with a curly lizard tail, which was a an interesting mutation. Yeah, and uh, I was telling some of the guys there, and apparently the beer is actually brewed uh, right near the uh, Sousa headquarters in Germany, and uh, it's got an open source recipe. They tell me. Um, I don't know if it's quite the same as the Open Beer Project, which uh, which you can find on Wikipedia and other places, uh, which is an open source beer, um, and with you know you can patch it with uh, with things for for uh, you know additional ingredients and things. You can submit a patch and stuff. Uh, but yeah, it sounds quite cool, and they, they've actually got it brewed for them special, and uh, they were they were selling the bottles for one euro. So I think there was a, that was creating a lot of uh, a lot of right. interest, and that's quite an interesting ploy to get people to your stand. Sell beer for one euro. I've noticed that yep. does get people to your stand. Wasn't free beer though. No, it wasn't free as in beer. No, um, no but I believe apparently it was free as in speech. So they tell me anyway, um, which is oh. an interesting irony. Uh, so we ought to talk about beer, I suppose, briefly, um, because that okay. is a big feature of Fosdem. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you go to the beer event uh, on the Friday evening? Because uh, there was the uh, traditional uh, opening beer event down at uh, uh, Café Delirium in the centre of Brussels, which seemed to me to be a, an impenetrable mob of people drinking cheap beer, as far as I could see. Mm. Yeah, there was a lot of people in there, and um, I think I, I arrived slightly later on. But uh, yeah, that was it was quite an interesting uh, an interesting party. I mean, they had three different levels, uh, you know, three different floors to that place, and it was still full. And there's lots of geeks everywhere, which uh, which was pretty interesting. Um, I'm not an expert on beer, I'm afraid. That's not my area. Um, yeah, it's um, it's to do with uh, it's more to do with my co-host on Linux Outlaws, Fab. He's a he's a German, so he obviously he understands beer a little better than I. But uh, yeah, I, I did quite enjoy it. I got some funny looks from from people when I attempted to order a Guinness because I noticed Guinness was on the menu, and uh, obviously you're not supposed to do that when you're in Brussels. No, no, I don't. I think that's uh, there's there's probably a statute against doing that up there. So um, w w did you go in any other dev rooms? We've we covered at the beginning of the discussion. The Java Dev Room and the LibreOffice Room. Uh, any mm. others that you uh, ducked into? Um, I'm trying to think now. I, I some of the Lightning talks definitely caught my um, caught my attention in the um, the main uh, one of the main halls by the entrance. Uh, a friend, mutual friend of ours, in fact, uh, Laura Tchaikovsky, gave a, a very interesting Lightning talk about get getting uh, open source software uh, adoption. Uh, into uh, UK government specifically, but I presume this could be expanded into other governments uh, around the world and she's uh, she's doing some interesting stuff about that now with a company i think i think it's pronounced seriously is it the company she's with now i forget now it's written uh, in it's lolcat serious serious there serious, we go sorry yes. yeah um and uh, yeah she's uh, she she gave a great talk on that and uh, she was very nervous at first as well so i wanted to make sure i went and gave her some support but yeah there was also lots of uh, interesting talks and one that caught my eye was um by um, a lady called Ginger Coons, who's uh, Canadian, and she's the editor of the Libra Graphics magazine, uh, which is an interesting project. They're, uh, they're trying to promote the use of open source tools for professional graphic design um, and, uh, you know, and things like that, which is quite cool. And she, she gave, uh, it was very eye-catching because we had all the standard, um, you know, bog standard presentations, few screens, a few words on a black and white screen and stuff. And then she came along and it was just like an explosion of color. And uh, she had all of her, her design stuff going on, which was very cool. And uh, we actually caught an interview with her later for, uh, for Linux Outlaws. But she's, uh, they're up on, I think, the third, ep uh, third um, 
edition of the magazine is due out soon and the plan is to hopefully get it into major distribution um in you know shops and things and uh, th there's very cool very high production value to it it looks like a very professional magazine um and she was giving them away free but uh, you can subscribe as well and uh, if you're interested and you want to have a look it's uh, libra mafic libra i can't talk libra graphics mag dot com is the address you need to go and look at or, or just do a search for libra graphics magazine but yeah i thought it was quite cool to see someone um, promoting the cultural side of, of, of that as well and freedom in art and creative commons and stuff. I mean, very appropriate because you've got your creative commons uh, symbol just above your, your head there on the wall. Uh, so uh, there was actually a very, another very interesting lightning talk uh, in the lightning talks room. It turns out that the European Parliament has a, uh, a free software uh, user group and they oh, okay. uh, had a lightning talk at lunchtime on Sunday to uh, try and get some public um, enthusiasm surrounding that uh, user group. that They hope that mm. by having a, a free software user group actually within the European Parliament, they'll be able to overcome mm. some of the, uh, the bias from quite a lot of the uh, MEPs there against free software. I thought that was a very interesting development that was unturfed. Mm. Uh, a nice side yeah. effect of having it in Brussels, having uh, um, uh, research assistance from MEPs come along. Yeah, I spoke to a few people who worked at the um, the European Parliament. As as you say, as you'd expect in in Brussels, there were a lot of a lot of them around, and uh, it was it was interesting. A lot of them seemed uh, dismayed about the fact about the lack of uh, free and open source software use within the European Parliament. They were talking about things like Outlook um, being stuck with Outlook for Mail, which happens in a lot of companies, obviously, and um, other things as well, like not being able to use things like Firefox or Chrome or you know other uh, open source web browsers and, and the kind of the mandate of Internet Explorer, uh, which which was interesting. I mean, it, I think it would be really good if they could, yeah, if they could definitely um, increase the adoption of open source software. And hopefully that'll be a good way to do it, to actually have a user group for people uh, people in that uh, in that area. So um, I, uh, one of the other things that uh, that I, I did at, uh, at FOSDEM is uh, I caught up with the Fedora project leader, uh, Jared Smith, who's the the current uh, Fedora project leader, and we talked about upcoming developments in Fedora and um, you know things that are going to happen there. And also, I had a little play with GNOME three, uh, which which is interesting. The, they had it on a touch screen, and uh, we, you could play with the GNOME shell, which is this new UI. Um, they're calling it a new desktop paradigm, which sounds like marketing speak, but to be fair, it is it is very very much a, a cool development. And uh, it basically it's uh, yeah it's a new interface which will go on top of the GNOME desktop and GNOME three due to due to ship hopefully uh, sometime not too far into this year. So it was quite interesting to play uh, play with that. And one uh, one funny thing that came out of that was uh, on the Open SUSE stand we were talking about. Um, touchscreen interfaces because they had large touchscreens there and uh, they were saying that they're not allowed to call it a multi-touch interface because Apple owns a patent for multi-touch um, which I thought was very interesting and uh, at the moment they haven't implemented it in uh, in OpenSUSE because obviously the worry of the, the patent uh, threat and so on but one thing they were talking about they might actually be able to do in future uh, to get around the patent is uh, is not referred to two fingers uh, being used to control the system because apparently the the Apple patent refers to specifically two fingers being used to control an interface. So one of the guys was telling me they've managed to get it to work with two sausages and they're going to call it a multi-sausage <laughs> interface, which I thought was <laughs> was quite impressive. So um, so you know you may be able to see OpenSUSE with patented uh, well not patented sorry uh, multi-sausage <laughs> interface soon, uh, which was yeah. quite cool. Come with pork inside, like an Intel inside sticker. Yeah. Let's imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> it could do, yeah. Although if you uh, if your PC is anything like mine and you uh, you don't clean the fans out often enough, you might end up with cooked sausages before too long. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. So lots of interesting stuff going on. Um, I thought the uh, one thing I had to give them credit for is the quality of the network in wireless and stuff at uh, at Fosdem. I think Cisco actually shipped some of their latest kit and installed it. There were huge. Um, Antennas everywhere, and uh, impressive when you've got, as you say, like three, three to four thousand geeks, each of them probably with two or three devices on them that need that were trying to get on the wireless. They managed to keep it up pretty well. So there was an interesting dimension to that, though. Um, they were advertising about how they had IPv6 on the wireless network at Fosdem, mm. but there wasn't actually an IPv6 DNS anywhere. So one oh. of the problems that I had in one of the rooms was that it had been configured so that the um, the IP pool on IPv4 ran out really early, 
and I couldn't get an IP address on IPv4 on DHCP. And uh, mm. to my great surprise, that meant I couldn't get on the internet on IPv6 because the DNS was only available on IPv4. And mm. uh, one of the problems we're going to face as IPv6 becomes more common is we need to get some people running IPv6 DNS out there because there just isn't one. If you go look at mm. the, uh, the Google DNS, even that Google DNS doesn't have an IPv6 DNS. So that it, that, uh, it's all very mm. well having a connection, but there's no way to use it. <laughs> Yeah, that's very that's very surprising. I mean, I know IPv6 has has um, taken some time to to take off. If you could even say that it has fi really taken off yet, it's still kind of finding its feet. But uh, as you say, until we get more DNS providers out there, it's going to be very difficult for people to do that. But it is a very cool idea being able to um, have a unique address out on the internet for every machine in your house without having to. You know, without having to buy a domain name for each one and so on, which is uh, which is very cool. So um, yeah, so I think we should uh, we should probably wrap up the uh, the Fosdem talk. But uh, overall, I thought it was a very very interesting um, event, and it was great to see that uh, so many people there celebrating free and open source software, and uh, so many interesting conversations going on. It's not every event you can go to where you can stand outside uh, stand outside a bar and just randomly overhear two guys next to you. Their favorite, uh, their favorite Vim command or something like that. It's, it's, it's what it's definitely a unique experience that people should, uh, people should go and check out if they can. Yep. So, um, so moving on then, let's uh, let's talk about what we've got coming up on uh, on Floss Weekly. Um, so we have, um, yep, next week uh, we have a Tornado Plug Project, or the Tornado Plug Project, I should say, uh, which is a uh, an awesome, very small full form factor Linux server, which uh, it comes on a on a, a unit that you just plug into the wall, hence the name Tornado Plug, and uh, you can you can plug it in and you can run it as a web server or a file server. It's got USB connections, so you can plug in more storage or well anything else really. It's USB, um, so that's very cool. Uh, so I can't wait to talk to, to talk to them about that next week. Um, on February the 23rd, Randall will be back from his travels, and uh, he'll be joined by Jeremy Carbo, Carbo, I should say, from Sunlight Labs, which should be uh, should be very interesting. And um, following that, we've got lots more cool stuff coming up. So stay tuned. Um, if you uh, if you if you go and have a look at uh, t uh, twit.tv slash floss, you can see uh, there's a link on there to the upcoming guests spreadsheet, and you can have a look and see who we've got on the on the slate to appear on the show and who uh, you know who uh, who's coming up. And uh, if you if you think there's someone absent from there that you'd like to see on there, a project that you want to see on Floss Weekly, then uh, the best thing you can do is have the project leader email Randall. Uh, Randall's address is Merlin at Stonehenge.com. And uh, it's M E R L Y N to spell Merlin at Stonehenge.com, and uh, he'll go right to the top of the list. He'll put them right to the top of the list um, because um, we always uh, we always put shows that uh, the email us uh, sorry shows projects that email us right to the top of the list, uh, which is cool. So if you want to uh, if you want to have a look at that, see who's coming up, maybe suggest some things, um, that would be very cool. Um, I'll be back on the uh, the ninth of uh, March in the in the hot seat in the host's hot seat, I should say. Um, but between them, we've got some cool stuff coming up, and I maybe you may hear me as a co-host as well in future um, in the meantime if you want to uh, find out anything more about myself you can go to danlynch.org which is where all my uh, stuff resides you can find out more about Linux Outlaws which is the uh, open source and uh, you know free open source software uh, news podcast that I do and uh, you can find that at linuxoutlaws.com and also you can find uh, Rat Hole Radio which is a music show that I do where I try and focus on independent culture and uh, creative commons and stuff like that uh, which this week features an interview with MC Frontalot which some of you uh, some of you nerdcore geeks might appreciate uh, he's a, a legend in the nerdcore scene so um, I was actually trying to explain nerdcore to uh, Tom Marble and Beat and Beat El Garby trying to explain MC Hawking was quite funny uh, in that that kind of uh, company um, but yeah so go and check that out it's at ratholeradio.org as well uh, in the meantime as I say you can find me on Twitter uh, my handle and identica of course the uh, the handle is method Dan that's the two words together method and Dan and uh, there's all kinds of stuff going on so Simon where can we find out more about what you're up to uh, if you go visit my website on webbing.com uh, you'll find everything you need to know about me uh, coming mm -hmm. up in my future, I'm going to be uh, uh, spending a lot of time at home uh, over the next month and then okay. off to San Francisco in mid-March where I hope we're going to be able to have a, an OSI fundraiser. 
Um, and I would also love to have everybody uh, visit the company that I work for, forgerock.com, and buy their uh, identity management from us. And I'd love mm -hmm. people to uh, read my column on Computer, C Computer World UK, which you can all mm -hmm. find linked from uh, that URL down there, uh, webmink.com. Very cool, very cool. So uh, thank you very much for helping me um, fill in this, this show, Simon, and apologies for the, the, uh, the lack of our guest uh, today, uh, dropping out at the last minute, but it did give us a chance to discuss our uh, memories of FOSDEM, which is always good. Yeah, well, it, you know, this is the problem with dealing with secure operating systems. Uh, it's sometimes very hard to actually log into them, and that was probably the problem our guest was having. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe he's off to reset his password. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you again, Simon, and we'll see you next time for another Floss Weekly.